Today we'll be looking at the larynx, also known as the voice box in layman's term. Because of the short size of the specimen, we'll be making a direct comparison with the model at the same time. Here I'm holding the entirety of the larynx as well as the bits of trachea and esophagus in my hand. What you see in front of you is the anterior surface. Now, because of the number of content present, it sometimes may be difficult to appreciate the muscles, vessels from the cartilages. Right in front, these two straps of muscles you see covering the front side, these are your sternohyoid muscles. And you can see how they're coming from down below. These actually originate from the sternum. Obviously, it's not seen here but they ascend all the way up and attach to the hyoid bone, right over at this point. Here I will use the yellow pin to mark the hyoid bone, right over here. And this sternohyoid I am retracting to the side so that you can appreciate the structures underneath. You will notice a cartilaginous structure here with a laryngeal prominence in the center. This is the thyroid cartilage. On this model, this same can be seen here right in front. This is the thyroid cartilage and the laryngeal prominence in the front, also called the Adam's apple. And if you look to the side, you can see two straps of muscles originating from the thyroid cartilage and ascending to the higher bone. This is your thyrohyoid muscles and they're present on both sides. The thyrohyoid muscles over here can be appreciated at this point, which I'm labeling with the yellow pin right over here. Here is one on the right side and the other one on the left side as well. If we were to go further down, there is another bump located at this point. This is the cricoid cartilage. And the cricoid cartilage is connected to the thyroid cartilage with a small membrane in the center. This membrane, which I'm denoting with the white pin, is the cricothyroid membrane. It is the same membrane which is pierced in cricothyroidectomy when ventilation is impossible through the oral route. The cricothyroid membrane can be appreciated at this point. Here you can see the cricothyroid muscle and between this and the thyroid cartilage, this is your cricothyroid membrane. Going down even further, you can appreciate two large lobes situated on the right and left of the trachea. These two lobes are part of your thyroid gland. The right thyroid gland lobe and the left thyroid gland lobe are connected in the center by an isthmus. And these two lobes, let's use a green to demarcate them. These two have their own blood supply coming from the top and the bottom. Now these vessels are pretty tiny so it might be very difficult to see from there which is why I'm going to pass a very small pin through the inferior thyroid artery. If you see on the back side, here I have turned it around here is a vessel coming from below and I'll pass a needle right through the lumen. This is the inferior thyroid artery. The superior thyroid artery is coming from up above but it is difficult to appreciate. Instead what we do see actually is the superior laryngeal artery. Once again I'll be using a red marker to demarcate that artery. As you can see here I'm passing one through the lumen and right next to it is a vessel which is occluded. Whenever you see an occluded vessel that means it's a vein. That occlusion is due to the coagulated blood. So this thing right over here is the superior laryngeal vein. Now that we've seen the vessels supplying the thyroid and keep in mind the superior thyroid artery is actually coming from the laryngeal vessels. Due to the occlusion, it's difficult to pass one through. Here we go. So we have the two lobes on the right and the left. Those of you sharp enough, you may have noticed there is a muscular tube situated right behind this thyroid gland and the trachea. If you see over here, this bony cartilaginous part is the trachea. You can see the C-shaped rings in it. And right behind that is the muscular tube, the esophagus. If you recall the heart we did in the first video, I showed you how the esophagus was directly behind the trachea. Same case in the lungs, where I showed you the impressions. 
the esophagus came first, and right after that, the trachea. So these two are located just behind it. What's interesting is the content present between the two. If I were to expose them, you can see a bit of fascia between the two, the tracheoesophageal fascia, which was originally called the septum. And you can see a bit of these nerves crisscrossing. This is your esophageal plexus. And uh, one of the nerves present here, which goes from top to bottom, is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The current laryngeal nerve actually is quite prominent, but it is not seen here. On the other hand, if I were to rotate this model, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is located exactly on the back side, right on this. It's not present on this model, so let's ignore that. What is present, however, is the superior laryngeal artery and nerve, and you can see how it's dividing into the internal laryngeal artery and nerve. Here is the superior thyroid artery, a branch of the superior laryngeal artery, supplying the thyroid. Putting this back, let's see the remainder of the specimen. Now, looking at from the top view, we've seen the backside, front, and the bottom. On the top, you may notice this elastic shoe-shaped, shoe-horn-shaped structure. This is the epiglottis and the epiglottis is connected to the hyoid bone with the hyoepiglottic membrane. This membrane I'm demarcating with a white pin. This is also the site where, where the tongue meets and you have the vellicula. On the other hand, if I were to go real back, here you can appreciate the laryngeal inlet, very nicely seen. It's difficult to actually go inside and see the vocal cords because it's quite uh, dark in there and quite narrow. It's actually much easier on the model. Keep in mind, this model is quite enlarged. As you compare the two, notice how the actual specimen is much smaller than the model. Here I am dividing the two in a sagittal section. And you can see how from the laryngeal inlet, we can appreciate the vocal folds. The top fold is the vestibular fold and the bottom one is the vocal fold. This is where you have the true vocal cords. The space in between is simply known as the ventricle. So we have the one part, the superior laryngeal inlet. You have the ventricle right here and you have the trachea on the bottom. This forms the entirety of the larynx and the trachea. Up in front you can even appreciate a bit of the epiglottis and connect it to the hyoid bone via the hyoepiglottic membrane. On the back side you simply have the back side of the thyroid cartilage and the arytenoid cartilage on the top lying nicely. The only other thing notable on this thyroid cartilage is the presence of this thyrohyoid membrane. This opening is the same opening which allow passage of the internal laryngeal artery and nerve. Having that said, since this model has so many other features superior to the larynx, it will do well for us to do them as, as well. Here I am separating the tongue and all its musculature from the larynx. Once again, you can see the vellicula present in front of the epiglottis and the periform fossa right on the side. The periform fossa on the specimen was located after averting all of this musculature right in the side. Again, it's very narrow and cramped in there and obviously we don't want to ruin this specimen so we leave it like so. This part which was connected to the larynx from the top side. Here is actually your lung. The tip of the tongue is from the anterior portion and here you have the posterior portion. You can see all these papillae present on the tongue. These circular ones are the circumvallate papillate. As they go and meet on the back side of the midline, this is where you have the formation of the lingual tonsils. The muscles here, and the muscles are really easy to remember because ultimately you only have to add the term glossal at the end. From the styloid process to the tongue, styloglossus. From the hyoid bone to the tongue, hyoglossus. The one from the genoid tubercle, which is present right on the backside of the mental process of the mandible, that will be known as your genoglossus muscle. And you can see two nerves here. This nerve which has a bit of a ganglion attached to it. This is your lingual nerve, a part of the mandibular nerve. 
It's suspending the sublingual ganglion. And here you can even see it's passing through the sublingual gland. Down below, you have a hyoglossus, uh, the hypoglossal nerve, supplying the musculature of the tongue. With that said, we have covered the larynx, a bit of the trachea, as well as the tongue. And we've also seen all these same structures on the specimen as well. Again, this was quite a small specimen. And that's why we couldn't find a lot of features in this. But these are still quite crucial and relevant in your OSPI. Thank you so much for joining us and until the next video, I love this.